The next presenter is someone that I've had a very long relationship with and even longer that I've known about. Um, so Me uh, Meg Stone, who was Meg Ritchie once upon a time, my father used to talk about this amazing woman that was extremely powerful, that was a strength coach, that this lady named Meg Ritchie, and he was like, oh my gosh, we used to talk training, and this, and this is at a time when you didn't have a whole lot of really, really strong women. It just wasn't that time when so many women were weightlifting, and weightlifting very heavy. So it was wild to hear about this. And then I was at a track meet when I was in college in the mid-90s, and this Scottish woman walks up, and I was like, I've heard, that's Meg Ritchie. And she, I believe right around that time, she got married to Dr. Mike Stone. If you've been living not under a rock in, this, in the sports science world, that is her husband. And those two, for the last 25 years, have been doing amazing work in the sports science world. But she was a uh, throws coach at Appalachian State, which is where I was going to go, but then, long story, I ended up in South Carolina. So I would throw, and then this, this lady who I knew was this amazing discus thrower, she still, since 1980, holds the NCAA Division I record in the discus. That's a really long time at 221 feet, and also threw 62 feet in the shot put. Is that right? Still, still has the British record in the discus. <laughs> Two Olympic finals, 1980 Moscow, 1984 LA. And the, you know, but so I'm sitting here, I'm a, this young thrower and I throw the, the hammer and I'm doing my little thing. I'm a little walk on guy. And this, this legend is sitting over there and we would see each other more and more at, at meets. And one day she goes, she, cause she's Scottish. She goes, ah, Bert, my favorite hammer thrower. <laughs> and she said that to me every time she seen me for 20 years. So part of why I invited her here just so she would say it again. Meg Stone. Ah, Bert, my favorite hammer thrower. <laughs> um, first of all, let me thank Bert for inviting me to talk to you today. I've got my cheat sheet here in front of me, so we'll keep on track. Um, the Sonex people, um, thank you for putting up with my incessant emails about this, that, and the other, and helping me out get here. So thank you. <clears throat> First thing that I want to do, when, do, when Bert asked me to come down and talk, I said, Bert, I'm done with these death by PowerPoint stuff. I don't want to do that anymore. He said, well, tell you what, just come down and tell your story. Just tell, and I thought, I can do that. I can do that. I can come down and give you some words of wisdom from this old age pensioner. And uh, always keen to share my knowledge, share what I've been through, the experiences that I've had. So we're going back in history. I was 19, and it was 1971. Good God, that was a while ago. 1971, I was talent ID'd. There I am, in college, trying to run the relay. First leg. Points for the team. We need somebody to go through a discus. What's a discus? Oh, it's that plate thing over there. So I threw about 114 feet in the first meet. People thought that was pretty good. I was, at the, I was lucky enough to be talent ID'd by a guy called Frank Dick. Now, if you don't know Frank Dick's name, you should... He is the chairman of the European Coaches Association presently and was the director of track and field for Great Britain for years. Wrote a very, very good book on training theory. So Frank and I linked up and I got in the weight room and I was doing my rinky-dinky little weight stuff and I was getting a little bit stronger and then two years later I found myself in the Great Britain team, my first international, a baptism by fire. Great Britain versus East Germany. Gulp. So there I am in Dresden, sitting next to a guy that, uh, Richard, you'll remember, sitting in the bus, driving into the stadium in Dresden, sitting next to Jeff Capes. 
British shop putter and world's strongest man at one point or other. And I saw these two young ladies coming up from the track with the DDR tracksuit on. And every time you saw that DDR, you knew you were in the real deal. Up they came, and I said, Jeff, that must be their discus thrower and their shot putter. Mm -mm -mm. He said, that's Renati Stecker, their 100 meter sprinter. I thought, good God, what do the throwers look like? <laughs> she was big. That was 1973. Three things happened that year. The first thing was that episode with Jeff and at the track. Second thing was the Europa Cup came to Great Britain, uh, the track and field. It was the top eight nations in Europe, and we were all competing at the Meadowbank Sports Centre, my national sports centre. You'll remember that bit you used to throw there. And then um, in that stadium, the Russians came, and there was a weightlifting, a, a weight training area, and two of the Russian throwers came into the weight training area on the Tuesday and Thursday before the meet. Chit Silva, who held the world record in the shot, Vianna Melnik held the world record in the discus. They came in, loaded up the bar, boom, there it is. Oh, 135, eight reps, 225, six reps. Went to 315, four reps apiece. Chit Silva, the female shot putter, went to 375, and Melnick went to 350 for a double. I got the message right there and then. Oops. <laughs> Nothing's happening. <laughs> oh, I'm going back to Bob's. Can you bring the slide up? There I am. So there was my journey we've started. That was the first lesson. You're not strong enough. You're trying to do an event that you're just plain not strong enough in. You can't compete with these women. About a week, two weeks later, I was invited, I don't know why, but I was invited to an invitation event in Paris. I was sitting in the hotel lobby, and then walked a young lady called Maria Vergova. She had just broken Melnick's world record in the discus. She sat down, and of course, we were sitting with two American hammer throwers, and the American hammer thrower came up with that intellectual question that we ask all the time. What do you bench? <laughs> and she said, uh, 200. And he said, you, you can bench more than 200 pounds. She said, no, kilos. <laughs> Another lesson, you're not strong enough. So between 1973, in 1980, I set out on a quest to figure out how do I get strong? How do I compete with these women that are humongously strong in Eastern Europe? I was fortunate enough to be involved in, and coached, well, not involved with, take that back, coached by Frank Dick. And Frank Dick was in the middle of making a, uh, writing a book at that moment on the only time you'll hear this word at the moment, Periodization. He was doing, writing a book on periodization with all of them, you know, the microcycle, the mesocycle, the macrocycle, and all the rest of it. And I decided these rinky dinky weights are just not cutting it. They're just not cutting it. I've got to find out what these women are doing. Never mind the steroid crap. I don't want to hear about that. What I'm interested in is what's the methodology? What are they doing? What exercises are they using? How are they manipulating the training variables in order to be able to produce these throws? I didn't care about what people were talking about the drugs. I didn't care about that. Because all, all I kept thinking is, OK, they can take all the drugs they like. They can't sit in a chair like that and look like they look. They're bound to be doing something. So I was trying to find out, what are they doing? And that, that quest went on for about seven years. And it was really interesting. After that whole uh, episode, I decided I got to get in with the weightlifters. So I put my rinky dinky weights in the back and I joined the weightlifting club at Meadowbank. And there's a gentleman that was part of the weightlifting club who coached the throws at that time Stuart Toger. 1975, Stuart and I started to work together very famous hammer coach in the US, 
coach Lance Dale to a silver medal in the 96 Olympics. I think, Bert, you might have had some time with him. Great coach, good guy. And so I started to work there. Stuart had a very extensive background in weightlifting. Even right back to the old Dunedin Club in Edinburgh, where there was a famous milkman who used to work out in there called Sean Connery. So he had a long, long history of weightlifting. And so I was very lucky to link up with Frank Dick with the programming, Stuart with the weight trainer, and the technique and the discus. And that went on to about 1978. 1978, next lesson that I learned came up. When you're in a hole, stop digging and make a change. By 1978, I wasn't improving. I wasn't getting anywhere. I was making the donuts. And why? Because I felt like I was associating with the wrong people. I, was, I had a good coach. I had a good programming. But outside of that, I was lost. I was teaching. I was starting at 9 o'clock in the morning. I was teaching physical education till 4 o'clock in the afternoon. I was coaching between 4 and 6. 6 o'clock at night, that's when I started my weight training and my throwing. That was not going to get me to an Olympic Games. So if you're in a hole, stop digging and get out. I happened to be around the back of the sports centre in Scotland, Meadowbank. And this guy came up to me and he said, are you interested in a scholarship to the States? I said, yeah, I wouldn't mind doing that. He said, I said, where are you from? He said, Iowa. Where's that, I thought. <laughs> and then he said, well, you know, I'm moving to Arizona in August. Arizona. You say Arizona to a Scottish person, you think about frying eggs on the sidewalk. I'm going there. That's hot. I can throw all year round. So that's how I ended up at Arizona as a thrower. Um, January 9th, 1980, set sail for Tucson, Arizona. Didn't know anybody, didn't know, I, the only uh, contract I had was that guy that I had met at Meadowbank. So I got off the foot flight and I'm looking for whoever and I got there and he said, I can't believe you've actually come. Because at that point, I was a British record holder in the discus. And so I decided that if I was going to make Moscow, that was what I had to do. I had a tremendous, tremendous uh, opportunity at Arizona. Warm weather, people supporting you. I made the change. I got out of the hole I felt I was digging for myself into a tremendously, tremendously supportive at atmosphere of intercollegiate athletics at Arizona. I turned up at Arizona, it's really interesting. Went out the first day. Coach says, OK, everybody, all the throwers, and there was eight of us, two laps. What? Two laps of the track? I've never run two laps of the track in my life. Have you got life support for me? Because I, I just did not run two laps of the track. I ran sprints. I did agility work. I threw medicine balls, and I was ready to go. I said, this two-lap thing is not going to stimulate my central nervous system to throw. I need to do something else. So the coach said, OK, let's change our warm-up. And we changed our warm-up. Next challenge. And that is the next lesson I think I've got up here. When you've got an opportunity, grab it and make the most of it. And that's what I did at Arizona. Number four, meet challenges head on. Went into the weight room for my first weight session. And here was the plain steel bar with two little plastic things on either end. And I thought, oh, God, there's no way I can work out in here. I'm going to kill my wrists. So I said to the coach, is there any place that they've got an Olympic rotating bar here on campus? I, I can't work out on that. Ooh, the only place that you can get that is the football locker room or, or the football weight room. Can we get into the football weight room? Ooh, hallowed ground. I thought, right, I'm going to approach the coach. So the coach and I went to um, the head strength and conditioning coach at the time, a guy called Tom Rogerman, lovely man, ended up being the linebacker coach at USC, terrific guy. And I said, is there any chance I could get in here to do my weight session? Because that bar in the, in the stadium is just not going to cut it for me. I come in here tomorrow at 6 o'clock. 
I said, six o'clock, no, 6 a.m. in the morning. I'm, okay, I'll be there. So I go in and I think the first day that I was there in the weight room, I think I, I was squatting 450 at the time for four reps. And then I was cleaning around about 305 for a couple of reps. And he said to me, you come in here when the football team are here on Wednesday afternoon at two o'clock and start lifting in here. And I said, <laughs> <laughs> so, that was me. I had my Olympic bar. I had one more thing to find, a medicine ball. Is there a medicine ball around here? Oh, come with me. So I go down this corridor, down the steps, along another corridor, and I was taken into this dark room. And there was the University of Arizona medicine ball. The first medicine ball I think they ever got in 1902. <laughs> so, I said, can we get some medicine balls? So, you know, I think me training methodology in the US at that time in the 1980 was a little bit different from what we were experiencing in Europe. And so things started to evolve. I got my bar, I got my medicine ball, I got into the weight room. And then all of a sudden, a couple of years later, we got our own Olympic bar, and it was placed in the women's locker room. And I could go in there and lift until I was blue in the face with the other uh, throwers. So we got our own facility. And from there, a young man was recruited, and he came to the women's locker room, and he said, can I lift with you? I said, we're going to have to watch. You know, there might be folk walking through naked, so we just, you know, well, let's keep it here. So he lifted with us. That young man's name now is Mike Gatone. I don't know if you know the name, but he's the High Performance Director for USC Weightlifting, working with Peter Stemus at the moment. So Mike and I and several other people lifted together. Getting the story going, probably more interested in my strength going out, coaching background. I got to a point in April 1984, where I was hired as the limited earnings coach in track, working with the throwers. And I decided then that I wanted to stay in the States, and that's why I took the job. And that's a lesson that I talk to some of the throwers or some of the people I'm working for. Don't get your focus diverging. If you've got a goal, stick with that major goal, get to it and keep going. Because my focus split, and it probably cost me a medal in uh, Los Angeles. Um, I became a limited earnings coach working with um, track and field and trying to throw myself. And then another thing came in. You, April 1980, I was approached by the head football coach. Come to my office. I'm like, oh shoot, what have I done? What's wrong? Went into his office, sat down, put his feet up in the desk, threw me a coke, and he said, what, what's your plans, Meg? I said, well, I want to stay in the States and I want to coach. You ever thought about strength and conditioning as a profession? you can do that? <laughs> and he said, yeah. He said, we would love to have you stay um, as the head strength coach for our football team. And he said, I've had 17 of the players in here asking me if it would be possible to hire you as the strength coach. I said, oh, and I hadn't thought about that, but I really want to be a track coach. And then he threw the hook in you'll be the only woman in the country doing it and you'll be the first. Oh, crap. <laughs> okay. So that was the way that I got hired at the University of Arizona as the head strength and conditioning coach. But as you can probably tell from the story that I'm telling you, I had a phenomenal background in strength and conditioning and putting programs together, doing my own throwing, periodization of the programs, manipulation of training volume. I was, I was into the whole thing for myself. And I thought, how am I going to put this together for a football team? Easy peasy wheezy. DBs, wide receivers, sprinters, down linemen, a shot by discus throwers. I got a javelin thrower back here trying to throw the ball. I got... I got... Um, I've got, line, I've got linebackers and I've got running backs that are decathlete types. And that's how I put the program together the very first year. Um, that I, I, I realized and I know uh, conceptually that you all need strength. 
So we're going to squat, we're going to clean, we're going to bench. That's for everybody across the board. Supplementary exercises I'll put in depending on your position and depending on what you are. So that's how I really organised the programme uh, that first few years that I was at the university. The other thing that I did was try to figure out a way of using the equipment that was in there, rearranging the weight room to the programme that I was trying to implement. Because we were heavily into hammer machines at that time. One set to failure. I was not going to cut it with me. I was like, we've got to get in here and we've got to lift. We've got to squat, we've got to pull, and we've got to get this, this team as strong as we can get it. Um, so I had two kids that, that uh, Larry Smith, the head coach that hired me, had recruited from Percipity High School in New Jersey. These kids, Mickey Mouse could have made them strong. I'm telling you, that is a secret. These kids come out the shoot, looking huge. I thought, if I put my emphasis on these two kids, and I really pay attention to them, and they're successful, everybody else is going to come along at the back and join them. So that's what I did. I made sure that they had the program, I made sure they were working on it, that they were in there all the time, and everybody was looking to them as leaders. And we got the, we got the first year, we got the clean. Brings up another challenge. Our uh, starting quarterback, uh, Larry Smith came to me and Coach Smith, he said, uh, Meg, uh, I've got a petition here from the team. Really? They're complaining because you've turned the music off in the weight room. Yeah, I have. Well, can you come and address the team? Uh, sure, sure, I'll come. Challenges, don't buckle, face it. So I stood in front of the team and Coach Smith said, Meg, over to you. And gave me the petition that the whole team had signed. I said, I'm going, to, I'm going to be absolutely straightforward and very quickly with you. The weight room is not a democracy, a la your petition. It's a, it's a dictatorship. I'm the dictator. I'm going to get things across to you as a team. We want to be good as a team. You, cannot be in a, you can't be coached well with boom chicky boom going in the background. <laughs> I can't hear you. You can't hear me. You give me ultimate attention, your complete attention, for two months. We get the technique going, and we're off and running. I'll let that music come back in slowly. I'll bring the bagpipes in if you want me to. <laughs> but we, we're going to work. You walk in that door, you're working. I don't want to see any of this, you know, lacy fair stuff. And put the petition in the bucket and walked out, never heard another thing about any petition. So it seemed to, if you step up to the challenge, you've got a reason for what you're doing. You know, I could have just thrown the thing in the bucket and walked out. I want to reason. This is why we're doing what we're doing. This is why we need to be involved in squat clean. Leg strength, extremely important. Driving off a line, holding a guy and blocking him, that's clean. So I was talking to them about why we do what we do. So things rolled along and things were going pretty well there and I really did enjoy that whole interaction. There was one interaction I think that I've got to share with you that I thought was interesting. Coach Smith said to me, Meg, you know, there was two guys came off the, the uh, field this, this afternoon and they were both going to have a go at one another. I think. One was a linebacker and one was a running back or something. And they were going at one another like two little bullies. And I said, Coach, that's unacceptable in the weight room. Totally unacceptable. He said, Meg, you've got to understand aggression. And I'm really. So you can throw almost 70 metres with a discus with no, no aggression. Is that what you're telling me? I said, here's aggression, Coach. In my opinion, aggression, uncontrolled aggression causes penalties. Controlled aggression when his games. That was uncontrolled aggression. Oh, 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 I see what you mean. I won that one. Many I didn't win, and I'm not going to tell you about them, but I won that one. <laughs> so, um, rolling along into Los Angeles, I was my top lifts, and I'll, t I'll tell you about my top uh, squat, really interesting. 
I was working in Brooklyn, in New York, for the summer. And I got a call from Al Lauter, come out and let's throw. So I went out and we were throwing, and I had a max test I had to do, and I had to find a gym that I was doing a max test on a squat. And I'm looking up and I'm trying to figure out where we're going to do this max test. And Al was there, and Art Burns, and all the rest of it. We go to a place called Lou Ferrigno's Gym in Brooklyn, New York. Awesome place. Um, started warming up and, you know, guys are really helpful until you get to a poundage that's close to theirs. <laughs> and then they disappear. And you're like, I'm needing a spot. Where were you all? So got, to, got up to about 450 for a single. And this gentleman came over and said, I'm fine, I can give you a spot. And it was Tony Ferrigno, the Ferrigno's brother, spotted me on that. 550 squat I did on that. At that. And it was, um, it was in preparation for the 83 uh, World Championships in Helsinki. So, I had a great, great time at Arizona, I loved it. 1988, oh, one other thing I want to... To, oh, I disappeared. Yeah. I'm going the wrong way. Yeah, build your network. So throughout this whole thing, as Bert's alluded to, I kept in touch with a lot of different people. And I think that's really important. You keep your, your network going and you're able to tap into people as would be. And I've got to thank a lot of people in the strength and conditioning area for supporting our clinics that we did at the University of Arizona. Jeff Madden, awesome. Jeff was one of the people that used to come to my clinic. Thank you. Yeah. What was that, Jeff, 1989 or 1990? Oh my word, we've known each other a while. Uh, <laughs> Thank you, Jeff. Um, Jeff, and I'm unfortunately no longer with us and broke my heart to hear about Doc. Doc Kreese used to come to my clinics. Um, Brad, Brad Rowe, still wor um, working at uh, UT now. And we'll forgive him for that, though. Um, <laughs> but they were all very, very supportive. And of course, that's where I first met my husband, Mike Stone. Mike came and, and talked at the clinic. So, very fortunate. Build your network, build your network. Headed off in about 1978, I thought, you know, this was about 19, no, what am I talking about? 1989, I thought, you know, I'm going to make a change again, another change, another opportunity. Um, at Arizona, I was very, very lucky because I did something called higher character. I hired a guy called uh, Dan Burke as my assistant. I hired another guy called Dwight Dobb. Dwight, Oklahoma Thunder, strength and conditioning coach for years. And I uh, was very fortunate that when I hired, I had to hire people I could trust. You wouldn't believe it, but sometimes there's people that will undermine you. And being a female head strength coach, hiring a female to work with you on football, you've got to keep your eye on who you hire. It's very easy to undermine you. I was very fortunate to have the support of people like Jeff, etc. So that was, that was a lesson. And I, I started to make the donuts. I'm just making the donuts. I had a great guy called Dan Worth, who's now at uh, UT. I'd hired another great guy, Darrell Etto, who was with uh, Houston for a while and in the pros. And uh, the thing was... You know, it could go on forever without me. I thought, I need a challenge. I need a challenge. Bob Bockrath, who was our AD, moved to Texas Tech, and he said, are you interested in the head strength coaching position? Joe Jurassic, remember Joe? Great strength coach. Took, took off from Texas Tech and went to Dallas Cowboys. Position was open, and the, head, the AD called me. Are you interested? I thought, yeah. Yeah, I'm going to go. And 
started off there at Texas Tech, and that was interesting. The first day that I got there, I heard all the rumors about how the alumni and everybody was going to withdraw their money from football because they've got this woman coming in. And I thought, okay. Two years later, we were in the Cotton Bowl for the first time and everything died. <laughs> Never heard anything. So I was at Texas Tech for a few years and, and really learned all about mountain oysters and all that sort of stuff. If you don't know what mountain oysters are, ask your friend. Um, and, and just learn the whole culture of football in West Texas. Very interesting time. One of the guys who um, was on the team at that time was actually written about in Friday Night Lights, Permier High School. So it was that atmosphere, that West Texas atmosphere. I was working for a guy called Spike Dax. I think that's how you say it. Spike Dykes, the way I see it. Interesting guy. He used to talk about stay away from all these, uh, all these agents that come in here. Them guys with uh, Mr. T starter kits and Italian shoes. You stay away from them. And that, that was the talk to the team. Motivation. Just a whole new culture for me. Um, at that time, I started to associate myself and uh, be, get close to, with Dr. Stone. Was he going to come down to Texas Tech or was I going to go up to Appalachian? And I tell my t the class that I teach, I teach a class called Management Skills for Coaching. I was earning, what, at that time, single woman earning $65,000, $10,000 um, bowl bonus, 75000 in the early 90s. Not bad salary for a single lady. And I thought, no, I'm going to move up to Appalachian. I moved up to Appalachian for a $4,000 consultancy fee. Ten days later, the assistant track coach took off and got another job. They were looking for an associate head coach, track coach, and there I was with my $4,000 consultancy fee. All of a sudden, ten days later, I'm in full-time occupation with track and field. So things just seem to happen when, you know, your reputation is out there. And I tell that to, my, to, to the uh, students that I work with, to guard that reputation like it is your last dime. Because if you keep a good reputation, people will know that. They will come after you. They will know that you've, you can get the job done. So reputation and garden are really important. Um, so... Appalachian, I'm up there, and this is a lesson that I learned at Appalachian. I, yeah, there, jump. I jumped to Texas Tech, I took a chance, and you don't be afraid of change, because I've had a lot of it, as you're about to hear. Watch your ego, watch your ego. Don't let it get the better of you. I got a call at Appalachian State from the executive director of Scottish track and field. Would it be interested in the national coaching position? I thought, I can write everything that's wrong with Scottish athletics. I am the person to do it. The ego just got the better of me. And I said, OK, we'll go back. We'll go back. I went back as a national coach. Dr Stone came with me. We were married at that time. And he was the chair of sport at Edinburgh University. Very prestigious position. It was the toughest job I have ever faced. When I walked into the team meeting, the very first team meeting, the team manager was standing in front of the team and we were about to compete and he had a pint of beer in his hand conducting the meeting. I thought, what have I come back to? So I addressed it. I said to him, you know, I don't think that's the appropriate thing to be doing, standing talking to a team that are about to compete with a pint of beer in your hand. The next day, I got a card with a black rose in it telling me that, um, you know, who was I, this upstart that had come back with all your American ideas trying to put everything right. That I realised, hey, this isn't working for me. <laughs> and from there, it got worse. <laughs> so I decided that that was really a difficult situation that I was in. I had to find a way out. 
Well, we took a team one way of training to San Diego. Dr. Stone took the, some weightlifters, I took some sprinters. We go to San Diego, I'm on the track, I see Dr. Stone over there talking to somebody. And I'm looking kind of suspicious. Who is that? Peter Davis, head of sports science for the US Olympic Committee. Dr. Stone came over and said, I've just been offered the job of head uh, of physiology for the Olympic Committee. I thought, great. But inside I thought, oh. I thought, well, let's go back. So back we went to the US. Doc took up the position at the Olympic Committee and I was going to walk the hills. I was just going to walk the hills for the next year or so. Ah, buy a dog, have a good time. Sitting in the living room, two days, I think two to three days I was back, phone call. Chris Carmichael, trainright.com, coach to Lance Armstrong. Meg, are you interested in working with the Paralympics? I hear you're back in town. Okay, I'll work with the Paralympics, yeah. Back two days, and from Dr. Stone's words of part-time, when he called me, I'm back working full-time for Chris Carmichael. So, I started working with the Paralympic group, and I'll tell you one thing that's really important, and I think is really insightful of me to put this across to you. You want to learn how to coach? Go coach a guy with one leg and, and a single leg amputee. Go coach a guy who's got one arm, trying to get him strong in the upper body. Try to coach somebody who's four foot three to do their event. That's coaching. That's getting creati creative, and, and you're getting your creative juices going. Um, so I learned a lot in that. Came a time, though, when I thought, I need to get back. I need to get into coaches' education because I was seeing some really stupid stuff getting done. I need to get into coaches' education. And a job came up at the Olympic Committee as a coaching manager. So I moved from Chris Garmichael's company into the Olympic Committee. And the reason that I really started to think about that was because I was in Lille, France, at the World Championships in Paralympics. And I was watching 10 dwarfs throw a discus. And I thought, what am I doing? What am I doing? Is this really what I want to do? Do I want to watch four foot three guys throwing a discus? Do I want to watch, is this what I really want to do? No. I want to get into coaches' education and I want to coach again. So I made that decision to get back into uh, coaches' education. And the reason that I took that job at the Olympic Committee was because I thought I could make a difference. Well, if you're in the Olympic Committee, and I hope they're not listening, but every four years, there's a turnover. Every Olympic game, something different happens. And so at the time that Dr. and I were at the Olympic Committee, they were moving away from sports science. Move away from sports science, you're going to lose Doc. Move away from coaching theory, you're going to lose me. I wanted to get back into coaching. Doc wanted to build a program, put a really solid program on sports science and teach people and help people develop and get a good education, which is what we all should have if we're working with young people. So, my ego got the better with me, but I got into education, education, education. And I'll start by saying, don't do stupid stuff. And boy, have I seen some stupid stuff in weight rooms. Let's make it up as we go along. Let's pull this workout out of my butt and hand it to somebody. That's not good enough. That is not good enough. And let me head on to ask why. This slide took me about two hours one afternoon. You can see up there, why coaches education? Do you believe, I couldn't believe this, there are young people out there that will run themselves into the hospital for you, the coach. That's a humongous responsibility for a coach. So don't do stupid stuff. Get educated. 
You can see up there it stopped at the University of Oregon, which is right in the middle of a, a court case at present. Don't do stupid stuff. Meg, get in a mission. So I got on this mission to work with Doc. Every student that comes out of our program, every student will be educated in the science and the art. And we will dwell those two together and make sure we have got the best educated coaches coming out of our program. Don't do stupid stuff. That is the motto of my coaching education. And you can see there, it's not just football. Basketball, swimming, soccer, they're all, we're all guilty of throwing workouts at kids in the name of, wait for it, mental toughness. What is mental toughness? In my opinion, go out and recruit it and then get them disciplined. Discipline people. You're never going to make somebody mental tough by running the legs off them. You may make them a little bit more disciplined. You may, make them, you may get their attention and get them a little more committed. But I don't think you're going to make them mentally tough by running their legs off them. And it happens all the time. That's a disgrace and it shouldn't happen. Next slide that I'm going to show you is from a 56-year-old uh, athletic trainer. And you can see what he said there. That trainer came out from athletic training and went into the faculty at this university. And he said, you didn't miss explaining to grown adults working with coaches why it's too hot to practice outside or the basic mechanisms of how your body cools itself. He said he doesn't miss telling coaches why you can't practice outside in the lightning or why an athlete who's demonstrated signs of concussion can't go back into play or less educated professional questioning my decision as if I want them to lose or I'm negatively impacting their performance. And he finished off there by saying, it, I challenge you to come up with another profession other than coaching that has fewer professional requirements and has more influence over young people. Most make the decisions based on emotions rather than research and science. That's why I'm in coaches' education. That's why it's so important that you get involved and you educate yourself as to what good training methodology is, what your volume load is in the weight room, what your running volume, your conditioning volume is, how do they merge. And that, that kind of education and background is what we do in sports science. You've got to understand the background. I've heard somebody say to me, oh, that physiology stuff, what is that? You know what you do every time you go in the weight room and every time you step on a track, you're having an effect on that young person's physiology. You are hitting their metabolism. You're involved in muscle uh, reorganization. Physiology is what we do every single day. But we'll just run them. Yeah, not just run them. Educate yourself to a good, good program. Okay. Here are two phrases that I really, I really like because all of us are facing change. And Dr. Stone and myself are on a mission to change coaching. Your head football coach has probably got a background in sociology, a background in, I don't know, education, criminology, which is probably more relevant than anything else you could find. <laughs> but, you know, he's got that background. It's got to, you've got to be, you're talking oranges and he's talking apples. So we've got to find a way of educating sport coaches so that they understand what you're trying to do and what you're trying to, how you're trying to organize your program. That's important. And it's not changing at the moment. It needs to change. You guys need to be the instigators and the gatekeeper of change. And Machiavelli said, there's nothing more difficult to take in hand, more perilous to conduct, nor more uncertain in its success than to take the lead in a new introduction, a new order. Because the innovator, the people who are us, 
the innovators of change. Are the en- they have for enemies all those who have done the stuff well before. And only lukewarm defenders for the people who want to go with us. Change. Really important in coaching. And make that change. And Frank Dick, my colleague that I still keep in touch with, in fact, I was on Facebook with him the other day there. Change is inevitable. You might as well stop the world and get off as try to halt change. Far better to accept it, to welcome it, influence it. After all, a changing world, change is the only thing you can really count on. And I'll finish up here by saying, why education? Because you've got to realize in every little village in the world, there's a great potential champion. They only need motivation, development, and exercise, evaluation, and implementation. So remember the huge, huge responsibility that you have as a coach. That young person is not about you. It's about them that you're working with. They are the key. I had to learn that the hard way as an athlete. I, it was, I was probably the most self-centered, selfish athlete that could ever be. When I came into coaching, I had to change that from my focus to them. They're the important people. What I do with them is key. Don't do stupid stuff. The end. How was that, there? Do you think I hit a home run? Yes. Thank you. (laughs) They liked me. (laughs) Thank you. If uh, entertain a couple of questions. Yes. Anybody have some questions for the first female strength coach? Yeah. Questions. 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 I've struck everybody dumb. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Yeah. So, so as, as a trailblazer, what principles? And I know you laid out some of them, but maybe more succinctly, or maybe your personal ethos or motto uh, to to the point earlier about defining this. Uh, what did you do to instigate cultural change? Because that, to me, seems probably the most uh, improbable task. That yeah, you had. I think you're you're absolutely right. It's very difficult. I mean, if you're a head strength coach and you are looked into football, how do you make that change? How do you? The bottom line is you got to learn negotiation skills. I do a whole class on negotiating because it's really important. First thing you've got to do is build a relationship with your head coach or whoever you're working with. Number one, that relationship has got to be solid. You've got to be, and not a relationship of here's what I want you to do. It's a relationship of can we have a good conversation. Let's go to Starbucks. Let's sit down, have a coffee. Coach, uh, coach Smith, the first thing he did with me was throw me a can of Coke and put his feet up on the desk. What are you all about, Meg? That's the kind of coach you want to work for. Um, And I think that negotiation and learning negotiation skills, and in negotiation skills, they talk about when you go in to talk to somebody, you've got to give to get. So sometimes you do have to give a little bit, but not to the point that that's hurtful to the players you're working with. And you've got to negotiate with the head coach. And I think if if somebody... If you're working for somebody who really is mentally clued in and they understand young people that they're working with, they're going to get what you're saying. But you've got to find ways. You're going to get some football coaches that, boom. You're going to get some swim coaches, boom. It's the way we're going to do things. Find a way to negotiate with them. Read about negotiations. Because in the negotiations, you've got to go into that negotiation knowing that you may have to give up something to get something. And so that, having negotiation skills with the head coach is crucial. You've got to be able to talk to them. Um, and, you know, that's, a, that's about the main thing that I talk about in my classes. Um, anything else that I can think of really hinges around relationships. There's two things that are going to kill you as a strength coach. Lack of communication and lack of relationships. 
You've got to be able to communicate and you've got to have a relationship with people. And if you take care of those, you might take care of those and it might be that it's just not working or you're not getting your point across or you're not comfortable. You know what? It was interesting. I did a talk for the NSC a few years ago and Phil, Philip Fulmer was sitting at the back, the head uh, coach of UT when they won the um, national championships, University of Tennessee. And I said right there and then, there's some coaches you just can't get along with and you can't get on with. You've got to cut rope and move. And it's sometimes you've just got to say, this isn't working for me. I can't do this. I'm going to look around for another position. Sometimes you've just got to do that. And it's not easy because these jobs are not readily available, but reputation. Your reputation is far more important than anything in this field. Because if you're a dumb coach, people will know it. Help. My husband is chopping at the bit up there. We've got to get home. I've got a 96-year-old mother-in-law who's waiting for her, for her dinner. <laughs> Thank you.